<clears throat> First of all, I should say thank you very much. I very much appreciate this uh, opportunity uh, for a whole host of reasons that would probably take more than 20 minutes to describe to you, so I will simply say uh, thank you to start. I also wanted to issue an apology before I begin because I understand that the, buy is, the bar is very high for these uh, talks and I will not be giving you a wrap today uh, if that's what you were expecting uh, from last year. Um, rather, I will be committing the sin of PowerPoint, but hopefully in a way that will be of use to you and help uh, raise some questions and shift the field of focus somewhat for the rest of the discussion of this afternoon. As Kieran noted yesterday at the end in his summary remarks, anthropologists are not very good at giving short bulleted lists of suggestions or uh, simply moving quickly. Rather, they're slow and they ask questions. And this is very much the mode in which I'll be operating uh, today. So first of all, I want to remind you of some obvious things. These are things that you know. Uh, we all know them, but we tend to, at times, forget them. What is innovation? Innovation is a very complicated word. It means lots of things. It could be something that people all over the world do, have done throughout history, even when they didn't want to do it, even when they were trying to produce exactly the same pot. They don't always achieve it, so things shift, they change. Uh, it's also a reflection of how we imagine the future at the moment. Uh, very much. Innovation has become an industry. Innovation is a buzzword. Innovation is something into which we place all kinds of hopes, fears, desires, dreams. Uh, it's a compli complicated reference. And so I want to remind us of that and of the complicated nature of everything that might be going on today at the outset. I also wanted to say something about anthropology, since connecting innovation and anthropology may not be immediately obvious to everyone why that might be something you want to do. And in this case, again, being slow and without necessarily a good list of bulleted takeaway points that I'd be promising at the beginning, suggests that there might be some value to what is the central move of anthropology, methodologically, historically, which is to zoom in and out from things that are very, very micro scale, particular people, particular places, particular settings, to large questions of the human. And it's particularly that zooming out process that I'll be focused on today to try and recall what has MSF been up to this point before it ever imagined having an, in an innovation day? And what uh, world might MSF be living in in which something like an in innovation day might be happening? And in doing so, I'd be trying to hold up a mirror for you as an organization, since most people in this room, one way or another, have a relation to MSF. So the place I would start would be going back to when MSF was itself a startup. Uh, it's not the language that people would have used in 1971, but I wanted to show you these iconic photographs and look at them for a second. Who are those people? What do they look like? How are they dressed? What things do they carry with them? What do they see as being essential? They're mostly doctors. There are a few journalists. Uh, and they all have interesting biographies, and they have many ambitions if you read their particular histories and get a sense of who they are. Uh, there are lots of things going on in that room. Uh, they're all white Frenchmen in suits, and they are dressed the way that doctors in 1971 would dress if you're going to a meeting about starting an organization. Now, if we move to 2017 <laughs> and try to imagine what MSF would be like today if it were a startup, you would get a rather different picture. Uh, and you can look at this little group, it's a smaller group, and obviously it's a fictional show that I'm referencing here, but you can see that it's a very male world still. In this case, Silicon Valley is a very male world. It's mostly white, although somewhat Asian. Um, and it is uh, it, very much a world in which a term like innovation is not simply uh, uh, a point of reference, it's in the drinking water, it's constantly there. If you're not innovating, you die. That is the assumption of Silicon Valley, which is rather different than what would be happening in 1971 in Paris. And if we put these two things together, which is presumably what's happening in this room today, uh, a culture of innovation, 
with MSF as it actually exists in 2017 as a large organization working, working in many parts of the world with people who come from all different kinds of backgrounds, have all carry all kinds of different stuff with them, have all different kinds of interests and ambitions and thoughts and dreams, you get a much more complicated picture. And it's a picture which is going to have some tensions in it, and it's a picture which is not necessarily simply going to leave us with one single path moving forward. And just to illustrate this, I thought I'd combine a slogan from that world of Silicon Valley and business and startups uh, <clears throat> with the logo of MSF. And I suggest you take this to the communications department in whatever group you're in, whatever office you're in, and suggest this would make a great poster going forward uh, for the organization. It would be fabulous for fundraising. And I think you could see relatively <laughs> quickly and easily that it might generate some problems. And indeed, it might generate some problems for any medical organization, because the concept of failure it rings a little bit differently. Failure rings differently if we're talking about health, we're talking about life and death, we're talking about people. The stakes seem different. And so the notion that you might try something out on three or four children, and well, maybe the fourth one survives and you can go somewhere, uh, that's a little bit different than the vision of what an entrepreneur is in Silicon Valley. So there's no surprise that you would encounter areas of friction between the value systems of these two different um, gatherings around tables when people are trying to dream up a future. <clears throat> There's also a difference in terms of the ethical framing of time, that for MSF, every day is an emergency. Somewhere in the world, something is going on. And while maybe things have changed, but certainly a few years ago it was the case, uh, it's only a minority of projects in MSF that are technically speaking emergency projects. Nonetheless, the organization itself views itself as an emergency organization. Several speakers today have already referenced that uh, this morning as an emergency organization. That is quite different than the vision of what the future is if you're trying to build a company, if you're trying to uh, expand uh, what medicine would be for the future, re-envision medicine for the future at a global scale, or even something like the Gates Foundation, which is somewhere halfway between the world of MSF, of recognizing problems generally that are out there, and the world of Silicon Valley, where the money came from for the, for the, the Gates Foundation, which is trying to rethink, uh, disrupt, and innovate an endeavor like medicine uh, worldwide. Quickly, as a reminder, I have to watch my time to make sure that I leave room for discussion, which would hopefully be the most important part of this. Uh, as a reminder, MSF has gone a long way from being a, um, uh, a group of men in an office in Paris. And I think I like this particular graphic that comes from, it was in the newsletter of MSF USA um, uh, recently, because it shows a larger picture and it fits MSF into that. And it's very clear that if anything, you're not a startup, you know, you're the establishment. And so you should be thinking not simply in terms of, of what you might gain from changing things in the future, but also what you might lose. You already have major investments. You have a lot of people who are working very hard on problems, uh, even as we speak. And so it's not a playing field, which is a blank slate from which you might want to reimagine things. And then I always like to show this graphic to remind us if we're gonna talk about money in the world and where money is really going, that there's a lot more money going towards death than there is towards life uh, internationally. And that's a larger political framing for the whole world of global health, various different kinds of endeavors, and the whole world of humanitarianism. So you're, you're a significant slice of the pie when you look at humanitarianism, but it gets much, much smaller when you zoom out and you take into account the larger frame. I then want to remind you uh, quickly again, very all too quickly, that MSF has been innovating for a long, long time. It just was not called innovation, and it didn't necessarily have a day dedicated to it. But within the humanitarian world, as I came to know when I started looking at you as an anthropologist, you are well known for having good logistics. I mean, it's not completely unique. There's the history of military logistics in the background, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's things you can unearth beneath this. But, in the 1980s, MSF developed a very good logistical kit system. And indeed, that's one of the things that is a hallmark of MSF uh, interventions, emergency interventions especially. Where does it come from? And this is the words of one of the 
creators of this uh, system, uh, Jacques Pinel, uh, basically it's what you would do as a human being if you're repeatedly engaging in the same activity, which involves travel. That's the basic idea behind the kit. And the kit has been very successful, so I just want to point that connection out to you. The kit is now everywhere, everything is a kit in humanitarianism. And that means it also becomes a danger once it establishes a form of doing things. It, because it becomes a problem when you start treating people only as visible if they fit into a kit. And you can't see them if they don't fit into a kit. Or the kit begins ordering your relations rather than the kit is there to solve a problem which you are in control of and can define. Now technology is very hard to talk about. Um, in uh, uh, any kind of way that would be uh, balanced. And I like to use this image for thinking about this because everyone in this room now has something like what is being imagined at the beginning of the 20th century as a piece of boys' adventure science fiction. You can tell stories of technology as a love story, and there are many things to say about cell phones which are love stories. We've heard some of them and we'll hear more of them and experience them in our lives. You can also tell it as a horror story uh, certainly when the President of the United States has twitchy fingers and is connected to Twitter, suddenly there are a whole new host of problems which can emerge which didn't exist uh, in the past. Um, but among everything else, I want to recall that Silicon Valley, the way I'm using that term, is tied to a form of business enterprise. It can shorthand as gadget capitalism, and a lot of it is about making money and speculating about making money in the future. And that is a bit different than humanitarianism. It may cross over in certain places, but its end goal of profit and speculative profit for an investment for the future is also a bit different. I also want to recall that there have been great innovations of the past at the very micro scale. Uh, the Band-Aid is one of my favorite, or sticking plaster in, in UK uh, parlance. Um, and there is a history of using surplus. It comes out of a moment where somebody who is being innovative used surplus uh, <clears throat> gauze and surgical tape to create a small solution to an everyday problem. And it became general, universal. I mean, everyone in this room, no doubt, has experienced this particular little innovation and seen it as a good thing. At the same time, it's a metaphor we use to talk about a kind of response that is not satisfactory. It's merely a Band-Aid. It's merely a temporary response. It's not addressing deeper underlying problems. And in many ways, everything that is being discussed here today is in one form or another a Band-Aid, and I think that's important to recall. It could be wonderful, it could have benefits, it could be very useful, but it may not be addressing the deeper underlying problems that MSF faces on, every, on an everyday basis. I also want to suggest to you that it's important to recognize use through time. If you visit any medical facility in the world, you can find waste, you can find surplus, you can find things which can no longer be maintained. I know a number of people are actively thinking about it, but you can never do that uh, too much. Even things that are magic bullets, which are wildly successful, like ready-to-use therapeutic food, uh, they have effects once they become a norm, once they start being used repeatedly in a number of different ways. Uh, they are not, in and of themselves, the best answer to a global food system, for example. They are very specific kinds of interventions. And they also, I'll just note, the one thing that keeps this, makes this a miracle, the hygienic wrapper, becomes waste once you've opened it. And we live in a globe that's full of waste. Um, and I also wanted to say something very quickly about uh, ethics and to recognize that while procedural ethics are important and valuable, and I'm very glad that there's an ethical framework for innovation at MSF, and I think it's looking at it and reading it, it seems like a good one, uh, to never forget the difference between ethics in life as they're being practiced between human beings and ethics as a set of rules. And even if you look at the charter of MSF, uh, which it's quite interesting, in part because it's very sim it was modeled on the Red Cross Charter, and it's very similar to uh, parts of it. I mean, it's modeled on, on the Red Cross tradition. Um, but it's open-ended, and it's been used in an open-ended way, and it's been debated, and it's been constantly a focus of, of elastic interpretation over the course of the history of MSF, in part because it leaves open the possibility that you, as an actor, respond to it as a human being in given circumstances, in a given situation, to the best of your ethical uh, understanding. And you can see this collectively, I think, in MSF, 
And I'm, part of what I'm trying to do is remind you as an organization of things that you may have forgotten that you yourselves have done. The MSF is excellent at amnesia. If there's one thing I learned over the course of studying you as an organization, you're very, very good at forgetting the things you already know, the things that you did not that long ago in a particular setting. There is the wonderful Speaking Out series, which addresses complicated ethical moments in MSF. And it doesn't have a simple list of takeaway points. It has a lot of debate. It has a lot of complicated history. It has a lot of painful moments for which there is no simple solution, at least not at the level of a Band-Aid or at the level of a humanitarian organization. There are deeper, deeper political problems in this globe, and you are but a palliative response to that. And I know everyone in this room knows that, but I think it's important not to forget it on a continuing uh, basis. If we're going to talk about ethics, we should remember that they're interpersonal and they're relational. And it's always the quality of the relations you have with people as to whether or not you can convince them of anything, including doing things that you think are beneficial for them. I would also want to remind you that you have done some wonderful work in beginning to recognize that people around the globe have different world views. They have different cosmologies. Not everyone thinks that life is the only important thing. For some people, how you die matters, and what happens to you after you die matters, and that might matter more than any medical treatment you might receive. That doesn't mean that people don't care about the medical treatment. It just means that they have other values that they care about as well. And that's one of the things, as an organization, you discovered by doing uh, perception studies. And so I think it's useful to always remember translation, to recognize that your real end users are not people in the field. They're the people you're trying to reach in one way or another. And you only reach them through translation. Even if you speak the same language, you're reaching them through translation to the best of your abilities. You have connections, but those connections are never uh, perfect. And they require a constant, a constant relational exchange in order to uh, achieve any ethically meaning and meaningful and worthwhile end. So I did my best, and here are four, my effort to give you four points. Uh, last, and the, Keynote uh, yesterday, there were five, so I'm very proud that I'm only giving you four. I've gotten it down to four uh, as things that I see as being obvious but important to always recall. Uh, recognize the difference between a scale of effects versus aspirations. In order to get people into room, often what they want to respond to is a big problem, like climate change, even if what you're actually going to be working on is never going to have an effect at that level. So there's constantly going to be a tension between the things that we might want to do and the things that we have capacity to do. Recognize use through time, that just because something happens at a given moment doesn't mean that that activity, that object or activity or procedure uh, doesn't have an ongoing biography and it can change through time and it may generate waste and it may require maintenance. That maintenance is at least as important as innovation. Recognize that ethics are lived as well as procedural and it's a question of what kind of person you are at any given moment in relation to other persons uh, that will determine the success or failure ethically of most engagements. And finally, think through translation and recognize that any exchange you have, even with your best friend ever, in the same language, is always going to be subject every now and then to slippage, mistranslation, uh, forgetfulness, uh, something that gets lost between the thing that you wanted to say and the thing that was heard. And finally, what I wanted to leave you with, this is still one of my favorite cartoons of MSF, uh, ever, and I try to use it for these purposes of summarizing the organization. She's asking, how do you do it at MSF? He's saying, oh, not like that, not like that, not like that. He's this stereotyped, grizzled MSF uh, doctor, of course. He says, so how do you do it? Not like that, but, th but better. Do you have another question? <laughs> and it is that kind of, of critical ethos that I think is central and important in an organization to never forget MSF only exists in the world because the world is terribly screwed up. You should want a world that doesn't need MSF. And that's important, I think, when thinking about innovating in a domain such as humanitarianism. Humanitarian action is with us for the foreseeable future, but that's not necessarily the world that we would want or the world that we would design or the world that we would seek. 
in an absolute sense of innovation. So I'll stop there and thank you and very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, um, Peter. That was some. Uh, well, that was that was fun, but definitely some sobering <laughs> thoughts there, wasn't it? We want a world where MSF doesn't exist. Um, I should have warned you that anthropologists <laughs> can also be downers. Also, they're not necessarily <laughs> uplifting and inspirational. We are, yeah, we are, but a band aid and a palliative response. But nonetheless, we plod on. So, questions from the floor. We'll take them in clusters. Comments, even. I was, um, is that an online one? Or have I lost an online person? Bye-bye. Okay. Peter, uh, no one for Peter, I, I was a little bit lost through that sort of lived versus procedural ethics. Um, it's actually really the first time I've come across that. So can you just expand on that a tiny bit for me? Sure, absolutely. Um, I was doing a number of things at high speed, watching my, my watch out of the corner of the eye to, in order to make sure not to um, uh, use up all the time. Um, it's the difference between having a code of ethics and what you actually do. It's the difference between having, say, an institutional review board and being a good person when you're engaging with other people. Um, and I do think there was a comment, there was, there was laughter in the room. And there, earlier there was a mention of a project which was reviewed by five different boards. Mm. And I suggest that that might be an indicator of a problem. If you have five boards reviewing something, that might itself be an issue. The IRB system came into being. Uh, when MSF first came into being, when MSF started, there was no such thing as the IRB. The IRB came into being in the 1970s in response to specific famous, infamous ethical lapses in the world of medical research. Uh, and has since expanded to address a whole range of issues and concerns and things. I'm not saying that IRBs are bad by any means. I think they're important and they're good, but they don't absolve you from ethical questions. Simply because someone said, especially if you took an online training module, which is what we do at my university, everyone, we take all kinds of online training modules, and afterwards, are you an ethical person? Because you clicked you know, on the right bubble multiple times. Um, my answer is, that's the difference between these two things. N not to forget that, that the, the real ethics starts afterwards. The real ethics isn't in the clicking. Mm -hmm. And the clicking might be helpful to remind you that these are some things you'd want to think about or things to avoid. But the real ethics is what you do after that certification. You're not absolved in that sense, is what I'm trying to say. None of <laughs> us are absolved. Questions from the floor. Yes, down here, Claudia. Sorry, just the mic down here, please. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I was uh, pleased that you focused on the ethical issues there, and I think you're absolutely right about the difference between uh, using ethics uh, for strategic purposes to get things done and to be allowed to do them, as opposed to actually feeling it and living it. And uh, there's often a gap. But uh, I, you also mentioned uh, the difficulties of flipping from, uh, from uh, innovation for doing good to innovation for making money and the challenges that brings. And I wondered if you could reflect on that a little more. Certainly. Um, I, it's not that I think you can't do both. I think there are a lot of interesting things going on at the moment in the intersection between the borderland, uh, between um, uh, those impulses the impulse to try and act in the name of some good and the impulse to try and do well. I mean, there are slogans that put these things together all the time and universities love these slogans because it's a way to justify all kinds of activities, especially around things like health. But we should not forget that health, you can make money at health, but your goal may not be making money. Your goal might be the well-being of a patient. And some patients might be costly some patients might not ever make you any money. Um, and that is a place where these things would part ways. Um, and the profit mo motive is a very powerful and also a very dangerous thing. Uh, and I could go on and on about this, so I'm trying to be uh, succinct. Uh, for this moment, in this setting, I would just uh, want to recall that MSF has been very wary of money. 
Uh, that's why you want most of your money not to come from governments. But governments are not the only powerful agents out there with money at this moment in time. Of course, there are corporations, and corporations have a lot of money, and corporations want to make more of it. That's what they exist for. Uh, I mean, that's, that's their, their central raison d'etre, and one should not forget that. Um, that's, that would be the beginning of, of my longer uh, spiel. Yes, uh, gentleman in the check shirt, right is in the middle here. Anybody else to follow that? Okay. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I, I really enjoyed, enjoyed it. it. And uh, uh, my name is John Pringle. I'm from the MSF Ethics Review Board. <laughs> 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 Uh, but that's not what my question is about. Um, so recently, MSF passed a motion to uh, promote a safe moral space within the organization, in part to reduce the moral distress of our field workers. Um, along the line of innovation in an organization such as MSF, how might you envision creating a safe moral space? Oh. It's a hard question. Yeah, that's a simple one. Um, <laughs> I was trying to be provocative, and I guess this is the hazard that you run into when you do that. Um, I, I would first say that I think it's interesting to hear that, uh, because I think perhaps the safe moral space is the utopian dream of our times, one of them, that that's one of the things we would desire. We would like to be some place where we could feel safe and at the same time address difficult moral quandaries. Um, in life, I think it's very difficult to find those spaces uh, fully or completely. I do think that there, if you work for MSF, that is part of the hazard of confronting how painful it can be in this world and uh, the secondhand distress that you can experience by knowing too much about things you can never forget. Uh, there are standard modalities in social science, not so much anthropology, but domains in social science, therapeutic forms of social science, which come up with different modes of attempting to achieve a safe moral space. And maybe if I'm understanding correctly what the desire is there. Um, but I think what could be good for an individual psyche may or may not be good for a collective or good for a world. At moments like the profit mo motive, there'd be t moments of tension there as well. Uh, because for an individual psyche, the best thing might be for certain things to go away, say, or for there to be a lot of discussion about that individual perspective. Uh, for a collective, uh, I do think the Speaking Out series is in a way a, what has performed a therapeutic function for MSF, for some of the difficult uh, moments in uh, the organization's history. Um, and I, I encourage all of you, because I don't think it gets nearly enough, enough readership, especially within MSF, I encourage all of you to look at some of those volumes. And I would encourage people who want, it's not a safe moral space, except that it's contained you know, uh, in pages or in, you know, online, I mean, in, in a form that's, that's contained, so you, know, you can respond to it. Uh, but it will give you a point of, of comparison and reference. And for me, at least, that has had therapeutic functions Reading can serve that purpose as well, to feel less alone and feel that there is a larger sweep of history and the particular moment may not be the only uh, moment of trauma around. I know that's not an uplifting kind of <laughs> statement again, I'm, I'm, but that's where I, uh, I'll come to to close. Brilliant. Um, a short, short question, if you can answer short, in, in a short <laughs> response somehow. Well, it'll be tricky, but I'll try. This will be the last um, one. In MSF, we're very fond of saying that somebody or some organization has behaved unethically when we disagree with them, forgetting for the moment that they may be acting according to a code of ethics that are in conflict with our own, but quite ethical, th seen through another lens, such as theories of justice going up against uh, uh, utilitarianism or the like. So. One's choice of an ethical framework says something about the organization. And I was wondering if you might comment on your perception of MSF's ethical character, not in the face of what we could all agree is bad, but the positions we take in the face of what others might see as good. Yes, I, I'll try to be very brief. So I'd just say that um, while you're more similar to the Red Cross 
the ICRC than has historically been imagined. Nonetheless, historically, MSF has always been much more flexible in its interpretation of its own ethical precepts. Uh, things like neutrality have come and gone and we have different meanings and different historical uh, conjunctures, et cetera. I would have a lot more to say about that, but that would be what I would note about MSF. You are much more situa situationalist. Uh, you are much more uh, willing to think about the contingencies of a particular moment as opposed to being purists uh, in interpreting an ethical code. And I think that, that there are advantages to that or disadvantages too, but there are advantages to it. A positive note with which to end. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Peter, thank you very much. Thank you.